So my name is Jae-Hook An from KAIST. So we have a this morning session for ultra-fast science, ultra-fast atomic physics, right? So we have three invited speakers. So I will, uh, uh, two of them are uh, second science of atoms and molecules and um, from uh, free electron laser, uh, laser, uh, laser assist acceleration. So first speaker is Oscar Keller. So please come on up. Good. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my talk will be about upper second ionization dynamics, and I'm aware that not, you are not all ultra-fast experts. So I try to hope I don't lose you during the process. So um, I, before I go into it, I mean, this is really an accumulation of work over many, many years in my group, and there have been many people involved. Uh, from the up-the-clock team, then we use different detectors, not only uh, cold trims detection, but also VMIS, and we did also surface science uh, results, and there uh, some theory has been supported within my group uh, from Alexandra Lanzmann. So when you go about optosecond science, so let's just be clear, an optosecond is a thousandth of a femtosecond, so it's 10 to minus 18 seconds. This is the time scale uh, on electronic dynamics on uh, atomic scale. So when you look at, for example, the orbital period in the ground state of a Bohr atom, it's about 150 optosecond. And the hydrogen molecular vibrational period is eight femtoseconds, so something like this we can resolve extremely well. So what we are interested in in the optosecond domain is really to resolve energy and charge transport on an atomic level on an atomic scale within atoms, molecules, and surfaces. And because this is quantum mechanics, people have different opinions about it, and some of it I will show you during uh, this uh, talk. So we start off very simple. We just take an atom and ask the question, how long does it take for light to liberate an electron? This is actually something that you ask when you study quantum mechanics and then they tell you, you should stop asking because it can't be measured. And we are now here and we are measuring it. But when I try to get my papers published, they still tell me I can't measure it. So let's bear with me here. So there are different regimes how you can ionize an electron in an atom. One is a multi-photon absorption process when the photon energy is much less than the ionization potential. Or if the um, a photon or the electric field is very strong, you can bend the Coulomb potential uh, in an atom so much that the bound electron can actually tunnel ionize, and this is called the tunnel ionization. And there is obviously a transition between these two regimes. And then there is a single photon absorption when the uh, photon energy becomes larger than the ionization potential. And when you look at typical atoms that we are looking at, helium, neon, argon, uh, you know, this photon energy needs to be in the VUV, which we can obtain today very nicely. And when you measure the time, there must be a scaling between the one photon to the n photon absorption process, right? And the theory there is also not very clear. When you ask different theoreticians, you get different answers. So um, we had just last year a very nice uh, workshop in, uh, where we collected a whole bunch of people in auto second science and said, what will it take to observe processes in real time? Uh, because the, the challenge with time measurements in quantum mechanics is that time is not an, op uh, is not an operator. So you have to be very careful about what are your observables and how do you then deduct the time out of these measurements. So I will show you a number of techniques that are being used today. And um, I will not concentrate on the high harmonic spectroscopy because that will be the main focus of uh, uh, Professor Niri Dudovich's talk next. So traditionally in the femtosecond domain, people used the so-called pump and probe. And that's very easy to understand how you can get the dynamics out. So you use a short pulsed laser and you start an ultra-fast process with a first pump pulse. You know, when you compare that with a, a bullet that goes through a balloon, 
an air balloon, you know, this would be the pump pulse, right? His, uh, the, the bullet goes through the balloon and starts the explosion of this balloon. Or you can say a, a strong laser pulse is starting uh, the dissociation of a molecule, right? And then you uh, take a weaker pulse, which is synchronized to the first one, and this weaker pulse is at a certain delay, is taking a snapshot of the status of the system. So in this case, the second pulse, the probe pulse, is the flash photography with this balloon. And so depending on the delay, you see the different stage of the explosion of the balloon. And then if you put all these pictures together, you get a whole nice dynamics. And this has been a very successful technique in the femtosecond domain. And it's clear how you get the dynamics out, right? So what's the status with attoseconds? Currently, the attosecond, even so we made huge progress in the attosecond pulse generation. This shows you the pulse duration as it goes with time. Uh, the challenge is that we have now in our labs typically nanojoule pulses with attosecond pulse duration, but instead of 100 megahertz, we have typically one kilohertz. So the average power in these uh, attosecond pulses is a microwatt versus 100 milliwatt. And this is really a killer for your signal to noise. And that's why this traditional pump probe experiment is very challenging. In the, oh, there's only a few labs where things, people start doing this kind of pump probe in the up second domain. Meanwhile, um, we're all pushing our laser technology to higher repetition rate because uh, there are two ways to go. Either you increase the pulse repetition rate in amplifier systems or you increase uh, the pulse energy out of oscillators. And actually we're getting into laser systems with multiple hundred watt of average power to even kilowatt, which are not based anymore on Thai sapphire lasers, which are based on solid state laser technology. And this is a fast moving target and this will actually allow to do pump probe experiments in the near future. So meanwhile, for the upper second ionization dynamics, there have been three different techniques used, which are a little bit different than the traditional pump probe. And the first one is the so-called upper second energy streaking that has been pioneered by Ferenc Krauss. Then the upper second angular streaking, which uh, I called the upper clock, has been pioneered in my group. And then the upper second interferometry, the rapid, was actually uh, the first technique that measured upper second pulses, and then has been used by Anlulier's group to do uh, the ionization. So these are three different techniques. And uh, I want to explain to you what time they actually measure. And the question is also, do we ultimately measure the same time with these techniques, okay? So let me give you a little bit first an introduction so that you understand what I'm talking about. So you probably all know when you have a light pulse, I mean, you know, you can have a photon or an electron wave packet. And a lot of things that you can take from, from, from light, you can also push to the electrons, right? And you're all aware that if you have a short pulse, a light pulse, the electric field is propagating with the phase velocity, which is omega, omega over kn, and the uh, envelope is propagating with the group velocity. You know, and basically a photon is defined by this wave packet, whereas also an electron can be uh, characterized by this wave packet. So when you propagate this wave packet in optics, for example, through a dispersive medium, there, uh, it takes a certain amount of time when you follow the peak of this wave packet. This is the so-called group delay. So this, uh, uh, this photon, is, I mean, this wave is getting a phase shift, and you can show that the group delay, the time it takes from this photon, the peak of this wave packet to go a certain distance set, is given by set over the group velocity, and it's the first derivative uh, in the phase. When you look at the broadening, the, I mean the, the pulse gets chirped and there is a pulse broadening, that is the second and higher order dispersion. But the group delay is only the first derivative, right? So if you compare then the photon and the electron, 
you know, you have just different dispersion. So a photon in vacuum has this simple dispersion, which means that the phase velocity and the group velocity is the same. And therefore, for a photon in vacuum, there is no pulse broadening and no chirping. An electron in vacuum, you have the kinetic energy. The dispersion is given that by this. And you can easily show that the phase and the group velocity of a free electron is not the same. And the group velocity is really what we normally refer to as the classical velocity of an electron, right? Because the group velocity is h bar k over m. It's the, uh, the momentum over m, which you then can refer to as the classical velocity of the electron. So you can definitely also use the phase shift that this electron is accumulating as the group delay, as the classical movement of, of your uh, center of your electron. And this is actually what is being used for, for the so-called um, Wigner delay. Uh, so when an electron, so not a free electron, so when an electron goes over a potential here, then your, uh, your electron wave will experience a phase shift because of this potential interaction. So if you compare it to the light gray, which is the unperturbed wave uh, 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 in this regards to the one that interacts with the potential barrier, you see that when the electron goes through here, it experiences phase shift, right? Which is very easy to understand. And the delay is then defined, the Wigner delay is then defined as the group delay of this wave packet. And it's the first derivative dV, d omega. And in, in more quantum mechanics terms, it's, it's the derivative in the energy h bar, right? Because the energy is h bar omega. So this is basically the time it takes for an electron to go through here, right? So this is the Wigner delay. And as I will show you now uh, with two measurements, the after second uh, energy streaking and the after second interferometric technique that Anlulia used, the rapid, they are actually measuring this Wigner delay. But there is a correction to this Wigner delay because in addition to uh, the interaction just by taking an electron out of the potential and you kind of assume that this process this is still up for discussion. We need to then see in the long run. We are assuming that the single photon ionization is half a scattering process. So when the electron goes out, it experiences this Wigner delay, right? But you also have an additional correction in both of them because at the same time in this measurement, you have an infrared electric field to give you the timing, the time reference. And in the rapid, it's the absor absorption of a weaker infrared photon. And this gives you an additional time delay, the continuum to continuum time delay, because this is like a dipole phase. And the phase gives you, gives you a delay, right? And the same thing in the streaking, you, um, you use the, the streaking and infrared, a stronger infrared field, which even affects the Coulomb potential, and it also ma makes a correction. And actually, theoreticians have shown that if you treat it in the, uh, in the rapid, in the perturbation theory, and the streaking not too strong, these two corrections should be the same. So these two techniques, in principle, should measure the same time delay. So, where, uh, so this is, um, can you click on the figure? Uh, there is actually one earlier here on the figure to the left. So it should start, the, oh yeah. So this is basically showing the energy streaking the way people normally refer it to. So the, uh, the uh, red one is the strong infrared light and then the green one is the vector potential. And you can actually show when you then uh, delay the, a short after second pulse with regards to the IR field, which gives you the timing, depending on when this short infrared pulse is ionizing the electron, the electron that is liberated gets then accelerated by the vector potential. And so you map the timing when the electron comes out to a final energy, and it gives you these typical streaking results that have been widely published by Ferenc Krauss and has been pioneered by him, right? But uh, now, uh, next. Okay, so when you want to measure the delay, 
you don't really have a time zero. So the first time this single photon emission was actually done uh, with a reference. So they, um, uh, they ionized from two levels out of two atoms um, into the continuum. And this is the streaking field that they measured. And then out of this one gives you the second streaking field. And then you look at the shift, the phase shift, the delay between the two streaking fields, and that gives you the ionization. It's actually the Wigner time, right? So if you do it with, instead of a single optosecond pulse, but with an, uh, with an optosecond pulse train, then your spectrum of your optosecond pulse is not continuous. It has this frequency comb structure. And so instead of having uh, just this one streaking field, you end up with actually uh, all these uh, side bands from these uh, uh, pulses, but then also you have a coupling from the two bin, which is this interferometric. And if you look at the same side bands, up and down, you also get a, a time delay between the two, and this gives you then the Wigner time. And this is a simple way to understand why these two techniques measure the same thing. So when you look at uh, the rabbit in more detail, so you go basically, um, you ionize from, uh, uh, from one harmonic going up and then the second harmonic and the infrared uh, pulse uh, is going through a pass with emission and a pass through absorption and they interfere here. And then when you take these two passes, take all the phases uh, into account and take the difference, the interference, you get this cosinus modulation in the interference with uh, this difference here. And this difference contains the Wigner phase and the uh, continuum to continuum transition. But of course, you, it also contains other terms which you normally don't know. And so if you do the reference measurements with two species, for example, at, uh, under the same condition, you can then take the difference and all the rest feel, falls out and you then get the Wigner delay out of it. So this is basically your sidebands and then you take the derivative of this phase and, uh, and with the reference and you get the time delay. So what you do, what we did, for example, because we implemented the whole measurement in a cold trims detection, which is in coincidence. So we basically have two targets uh, in, in the gas, and we ionize with an optosecond pulse at an unknown time zero, uh, and then look at what, uh, when are these electrons coming out from these two species, um, what is the time difference between the two. Okay, so we did that with a cold trims detector. The cold trims detector is a very nice detector that has been pioneered from the University of Frankfurt. And it measures uh, uh, when you come in with an infrared pulse and the VUV pulse that is ionizing the uh, gas, you actually then detect the, uh, uh, the ions and the electrons in coincidence. So you know which electron belongs to which ion. Right? And so when you do that with the right mixture of gas, for example, argon and neon, you can actually then deduct the streaking traces which otherwise would overlap totally uh, energetically and therefore would not uh, be uh, allowed to measure them in, uh, um, at the same time. You then can basically do the alg retrieval algorithm, taking into account the auto chirp, the frequency dependent ionization cross section, and the frog crack al algorithm. And if you do this correctly, you get basically a difference in this ionization delay as a function of photon energy. And we can actually show that the difference between argon and neon is that the electron from the neon atom comes earlier than the electron from the argon atom. And when you look at the, an, uh, the energy, the photon energy of 34 eV, it's about 40 optosecond, right? So these are real numbers. So this is the Wigner delay. 
And this is actually uh, the theory by Kreifetz, uh, which is in pretty good agreement. Remember, the first publication by Ferenc Krauss was not in agreement with the theory, but this measurement actually is in agreement with, uh, with the theory, right? So the same thing you can do with rabbit. So once you have these two beams in it, you can also do the coincidence in with rabbit and separate it, do the whole rabbit with outer second pulse strengths, deduct the delay, and what do we get? Something else. When we go to 34, uh, uh, 34 EV, we have not 40 attoseconds. We are more like at 75 attoseconds, right? So the electron, at least from neon, still comes earlier uh, than the argon, but we have a difference. And then, of course, when you have a difference, oh, okay, what's going on? And I visited uh, Anne Lillier's group uh, just in spring, and we just discovered that we did the same measurement independently from each other. We used different measurement technique. They actually didn't do it in coincidence, and had to be very, very careful how they cal uh, uh, calibrated the time. But, you know, then we looked at each other and we said, should we compare? <laughs> and we did. And actually, the measurements, independently in the group, the red data is what basically has been measured by Anne and this one is by us, and so this is, a little, uh, is actually in pretty good agreement within the error bar. And if you actually go to helium and neon gas, we have actually a perfect agreement between our results with the rabbit. Okay, so there is still an issue, and, and the theory, another theory pre uh, actually predicts that our rabbit result is also okay, right? But you know, with theory, I'm always a little bit suspicious. They need to do me the theory before I show them the data, right? So, um, I mean, so there is definitely still some issues, but now that everything is working, of course, we can start doing all the measurements because we can do angle resolved ionization delay and so on, and we actually already see an angularly uh, dependent delay, which, of course, would also have an effect. So we are still in the progress of getting everything sorted out uh, in the details of these delays. We've also started with molecules and so on. I mean, it's a playground, right? You just start going. going. Now, when you uh, then look at this Wigner delay with the tunnel ionization, the Wigner delay in the tunnel ionization is a problem. Because when you look at the group delay, and you look at a, ba a tunnel barrier, we know that the electron is dispersing while it propagates, the phase and group velocity is different even in vacuum. So, but a tunnel, a tunnel barrier has normally also a filter associated with it. So if you have a dispersed wave packet in addition to a filter, you can get any kind of delay out of this measurement if you just look at the peak of the a wave packet. And as Mar Marcus Bütiker, who uh, died, unfortunately, put it when I visited him to learn about tunneling uh, physics, he told me there is no conservation law of the peak of the wa wave packet, right? So the Wigner delay is really not the right way to look at the delay in a tunneling process. So what is then the right way? So there is a Gedanken experiment, which is a beautiful Gedanken experiment, but I just don't know how to do it in, exper uh, in experiments, is that you say you have a tunnel barrier with a uniform magnetic field, which is only present in the tunnel barrier, which of course is hard to do, right? And you send an electron with a spin through this tunnel barrier, and only in the tunnel barrier you have the precession of the spin, and then you look at the rotation of the spin in it, and then you ask, uh, and the rotation angle gives you then the tunneling time. That's the time the electron has been in the tunnel, right? It's pretty obvious. So this is the called the Larmor time. And so with the tunnel ionization, we have this bound electron, and we send the, uh, we, we, we want to know how long does it take for the electron to tunnel through this barrier. And our result with the upper clock is actually consistent with the Larmor time not with the Wigner time. So when you look at um, the tunnel barrier in the triangular approximation, you can uh, actually calculate the tunneling time as a function of the uh, peak electric field, which is effectively the width of, of this tunnel barrier. And you know, our data is shown here with the outer clock, okay, which is consistent with the Larmor time 
but it's not consistent with the Wigner time, it's not consistent with the Bittico Landauer time, it's not consistent with the Keldish time, which is up here, right? It is also consistent, which is, I think, what is so beautiful, is it is consistent with the Feynman path integral formalism. So Alexandra Lanzmann then did the um, uh, Feynman path integral calculation for this uh, tunneling process. And the Feynman path has the advantage that you can define a tunneling time very clearly because each trajectory is a deterministic trajectory and then you average the, the times over all this trajectory and you get a, a tunneling time, a mean tunneling time. And if you apply that, it also agrees with our data. So this is pretty good, right? So how did we measure this? And why are we not with the Keldish time? The Keldish time has been around for, since the 60s, right? But you can actually go into the paper and, and actually even understand it what this Keldish time is, because you can actually go to this paper and basically what, uh, what Keldish did at that time, he used the triangular approximation for this uh, tunnel barrier. He, the notation is that I is the ionization potential in this uh, and omega is the center of the, uh, of the infrared field. And then, you know, when you read through it, he, he takes the tunnel barrier width, which is the, uh, the width that is given here in the triangular approximation. So it's very easy to derive. A, uh, F is the electric field, typical notation in the Russian literature. And then you assume that you have a bound electron in a, in a Kuno potential and using the virial theorem, you can actually calculate an average velocity of this electron inside the Coulomb potential, right? And then all he did was actually, um, how long does it take? Because you have an initial velocity, which is this, uh, with this, this average velocity of this bound electron. And after the tunneling, the exit velocity is zero. And all he did is basically defining the tunneling time as L over, uh, over an average barrier velocity, which is a half of this initial velocity. And he gets out of that the tunneling time. So isn't that not surprising that we don't measure that? Because that's kind of a classical approach, right? Pretty much, I mean, kind of an, it's actually imaginary down there, right? In the tunnel barrier. So you can also show if you would do an integral, you get to the same thing. So we're not measuring this time, not the Keldish time. So when you then look in more detail here, so these are all our, our data point. Uh, for in helium, and then when you look at actually as a function of the time it takes as a, as a function of barrier width in atomic units or in angstrom, you can see, I mean, we're going far, far away from, from the atom, and, you know, and basically our, uh, our um, um, time it takes goes from about 30 attosecond up to about uh, 70, 80 attosecond. And it's definitely uh, much faster than if you suddenly would take the tunnel barrier away and let uh, the electron propagate over the distance, which is mean velocity that it had at the beginning, right? And it's definitely um, slower than the speed of light. It's not superluminal. And it's not instantaneous, which actually would bother me, right? Why should anything be instantaneous? So, now how did we measure it? That's now a justified question, right? Okay, so bear with me. Yes, I still have time. So, when you take a short infrared pulse in circular polarization, then the peak of the magnitude of your electric field is rotating in space here on this red curve. And it is clear it's a superposition of two um, linearly polarized lights which are phase shift of 90 degrees C, which is shown here. So when you look at the magnitude of the electrical field in a circular polarized light, it is slowly increasing, reaching a maximum and going down. And when you look into the pro uh, propagation direction, you can look at the peak of the electric field trajectory shown here from increasing slowly, going up, increasing down. In the tunnel ionization, everything happens here when you are uh, close to the maximum because the tunnel ionization is a highly nonlinear process and therefore everything happens within this one cycle, right? 
So when what we are then having for the tunnel uh, experiment in the octoclock, clock, we have actually a perfect watch, a clock, which is the same macroscopically and microscopically. It's the same in the atom because it's just the electric field that the atom does not affect the strong infrared field. So, and we can characterize the infrared field, everything, the spectrum, the phase, everything. We know exactly the spectrum and uh, uh, with what uh, frequency this electric field is rotating around, right? So we actually have a stopwatch. This is how we measure time macroscopically. This is how time is defined, right? Fraction of an oscillation or counting oscillation. This is the perfect time measurement. So one degree, when you actually use the other clock um, at 800 nanometer, the full rotation of the electric field is, um, um, is 2.7 femtoseconds. So one degree is 7.5 octosecond. What do we measure at the end? So time zero is basically uh, the, the, the maximum electric field. This is the most probable ionization instant. It's a well-defined time zero in this tunneling experiment. And what do we measure? We measure the final electron momentum after the short pulse. And we take basically the most probable trajectory, the one we repeat this measurement many times and take the direction of the uh, final electron momentum with the highest electron count, right? And then the angle in what direction it goes is then the tunneling delay. So let me go, so can you click on this one? So it's a two-step model. We assume that the electron tunnel ionizes at the peak of the electric field instantly. So you have the peak of the electric field going around, circle, boom, the electron comes out and keeps being accelerated by the reminding part of the electric field. And you treat the electron classically with Newton in this two-step model, very similar to the three-step model by um, Corkum, Levenstein, and so on. So you can actually show analytically if you neglect the Coulomb interaction of the electron uh, with the parent ion, you can actually show that then the electron will come out when it goes out instantaneously at the maximum, exactly at 90 degrees. Now, we did the experiment with helium. We did the experiment also with a whole bunch of atoms, but we went back for the more precise measurement back to helium because uh, when you actually have the helium, uh, the single electron approximation is very well, uh, is very good in that regime. And the only parent electron interaction is actually the Coulomb potential. So that when the electron tunnels out, it not only sees the laser potential, uh, the laser field, but also the Coulomb potential out there. And you want to know what is the exit of the tunnel. And this is actually a textbook problem in this single electron approximation, that if you take the Schrodinger equation in the parabolic coordinates, uh, then the Schrodinger equation can be separated and you get in the, uh, in the eta coordinate, you get this Coulomb uh, tunnel barrier in the xi uh, coordinates, you have a bound state, so you don't need to take this into account. And you can actually determine the exit radius um, with the electric field and the Coulomb potential precisely as a a correct solution to the problem to the Schrodinger equation. So we know the exit and then we propagate with Coulomb, with the correct Coulomb potential, the correct electric field and determine what is the final uh, momentum. And so I, uh, this shows you the data, okay? Uh, typical data of the peak search in the plane of polarization with the electron counts. So you can very nicely determine the peak of the electron counts at what angle it happens. The, uh, uh, and we actually use uh, not perfect circular polarization, but actually slightly elliptical because with the elliptical polarization we have a clearly defined 
maximum electric field by the main axis of the, elect, uh, of the elliptical polarization. And that one you can also measure independently and is extremely stable and set by the quarter wave plate that you use. So you have two measurements which are commuting, if you want to say, in quantum mechanics. So, you know, the orientation of the polarization axis and the peak of the most probable uh, ion uh, tunnel ionization event. And then when you look at the angle offset, you, uh, you then can deduct the tunneling time. So, and there is another sanity check with these at the clock. You can actually get the orientation of the elliptical polarized clock or anti-clockwise. And the data should actually then be uh, next to the 90 degree C, just shifted around. And they should, of course, give you the same offset angle, the same tunneling time as a sanity check that everything is being correctly done. And this shows you the data, blue and red, clock and anti-clockwise. And also, it's a, a very interesting, I mean, uh, the cold trim, I mean, the higher intensity was done with the cold trims, the lower intensity with the VMIS, and they overlap in the overlapping thing. Now, the theory that um, basically Alexander Lanzmann did with the Feynman path integral has another implication. The other implication is actually that uh, the, normally what people kind of argue is saying, oh, the instant when the electron is ionized and let's look at the dynamics, there is no instant, there is a certain probability distribution how the whole is created. Right? So uh, there is a uncertainty at the exact timing when the hole is created, which is purely a prediction that would come out of the Feynman path integral. And one of our goal is also with uh, auto second transient absorption to ultimately see if we can see this, uh, this, um, uh, this uncertainty in the whole creation. So I hope I, I, I could convince you that we are having some very interesting measurements. We're not just doing measurement technique. We're actually getting into the physics. And we're getting some real results. And, you know, these techniques bring wonderful uh, data. I mean, the signal to noise is excellent. They are reproduced by different groups, by different techniques. Right? And we're really getting into the physics of auto-second science, which will get a lot of emotions going because people have different opinions about time on an atomic scale. I mean, that you should see my reviews that I'm getting on my papers. <laughs> I will publish them once on an after-dinner talk. <laughs> so, what's next? So, what's next? Um, of course, we will do measure, uh, more measurements because it's clear now that we uh, have this whole thing going. We will just keep doing measurements. I mean, I'm an experimentalist and I just do precision measurements and then we'll see how it goes on, right? So we do angle resolved molecules and so on and see what we get. Um, we need to sort out the difference between the streaking and the rapid. I mean, we need to use different techniques and get the same measurements. And if not, then we need to find out why. I mean, there is obviously, I mean, I personally have, um, I really like the rapid measurements because the infrared field is much weaker. It's actually a perturbation, whereas the streaking infrared field in the energy streaking is, is strong. It's stronger. And so there might be some effects there that needs to be taken into account. It's for sure an issue for molecules and surfaces, right? What about the other clock technique? I mean, but we can also use it for single photon ionization, right? Because we can actually then uh, synchronize it with, an inf uh, with a VUV pulse and use then the angular streaking instead of the linear streaking to see if we measure the same time. My guess is probably not the same time as the Wigner delay, but you know, we will see. So with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you for a nice talk. So, so this is time for questions and comments. Thank you for all this uh, 
Wonderful talk. And uh, you say that at the beginning that for the moment the ATO second policies were not very strong, and you gave us some uh, um, remark that uh, maybe it will change in the future. Can you comment on that and give us uh, the main direction which uh, will allow to have more uh, energy in the process? Right. So basically the question is about the signal to noise to do this uh, very well established pump probe also in the auto second domain. Um, the, there are two directions right now. One is to keep the repetition rate still in the kilohertz but increase the pulse energy of the infrared field so that you get microjoule pulses in an auto second pulse at a kilohertz to get enough average photon flux to measure anything, everything. That's okay if you want to do nonlinear autosecond physics, because then, um, you know, at the same time, you have a, a very strong infrared field, you have a lot of pulse energy, then, you know, microjoule pulse energy in the autosecond uh, domain. If you want to do surface dynamics, you just screen the hell out of the, your target, right? You create so many electrons that you cannot pull any decent physics out of it. So the other way is to not increase the pulse energy, keep the pulse energy at a nanojoule, but increase the repetition rate into the 100 megahertz regime. And this is being done uh, with uh, pushing the oscillators, the mode-locked lasers, to higher and higher average power. I mean, we're now basically with season mode-locked ytterbium, uh, ytterbium yak, thin disk laser, dipump solid state oscillator, no amplifiers. We are at about 300 watt of average power. We are in the, in the 40 microjoule uh, at, you know, a few megahertz pulse repetition rate. And I think we can get up to uh, the 100 microjoule regime um, in the megahertz regime, which I think is necessary to get into this autosecond pulse generation, but then with uh, even less than a nanojoule pulse energy. But that's okay if we want to do surface science, because we don't want to get more pulse energy out. So I will concentrate on the, la uh, on the last one. Other people concentrate on the first one. Other questions? So I, <clears throat> I wonder a little about the effects of Coulomb. For me, in the Keldish theory, the Coulomb, in, in a sense, is treated very badly. Right. Okay, we'll just go through this imaginary time and through the barrier, it's kind right. of... Very primitive, okay? Right. If you do the three-step model, it's, a, it's also very badly because in, the, in a sense, in the continuum, you always use Volkov approximations of mm -hmm. plane, which you mm -hmm. can have mm -hmm. corrections to that, but uh, probably nobody has calculated delay times with those. I don't know the recent literature, but in the calculation of uh, Alexandra, uh, I understand that the Coulomb is uh, is treated exactly. Properly. Yes. Right, exactly, right. Okay. You should invite her sometimes. She's okay. very good. Good. Good, great. Yeah, uh, well, this is certainly a very uh, interesting talk. You're certainly measuring something. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But it, perhaps a question of interpretation as to uh, what you what you mean by this in a more philosophical sense. I mean, you can't beat the uncertainty principle, the energy time uncertainty principle, and so there's a limit to how much time resolution you can get without losing all control of the energy. Okay, uh, would you I'm not, of course not prepared, agree? you know, I have heard anything that you can bring up, I've heard it, right? So, uh, what is, you know, that's exactly, when you talk about the uncertainty principle, you have to be aware of your observables. So what is your observable? So in the outer clock, for example, your observable is the electron momentum vector. What is the, the one, the uncertainty principle to the, uh, to the um, electron momentum? It's space. So in the gas target, you have a macroscopic laser focus, and anywhere in this laser focus, you have an ionization, one ionization event. So there is an uncertainty where exactly in this laser focus the ionization event occurs. It's macroscopic. That gives you no limitation in, in the uncertainty of the momentum, which is larger than our measurement error. So I can measure electron momentum extremely precisely, right? And all I'm doing is 
what is the angle of this electron momentum in this polarization plane? So, no problem. And then the time zero uh, is an independent second measurement, which is the polarization ellipse. That one is not affected by an ionization event. It's stable. So it's two independent measurements, and I take the difference. No problem with uncertainty principle. Does this answer your question? <laughs> you know, I've heard it all. <laughs> I'm, I'm good by now. Okay. So I, I've been trying to uh, uh, figure out how to phrase this question. You're measuring something very clearly. That is, you, what your experiment is, there's, there's no question about it. Now, right. what I'm trying to understand is, what's the big deal with the theory? That is, you know, you got an atom, you got uh, electric fields. May, I, it seems like, like, uh, like these electric fields are, are classical. That is, uh, it, it doesn't look like I'm, I, I should be having to quantize the no. fields. No. I just, I'm doing the quantum mechanics of an atom. Right. What's the big deal? Why can't you just solve yeah. Schrodinger's equation? I mean, look at the famous, okay, <laughs> what's the big deal? Look at about the tunneling time and all the famous name associated with the different tunneling time. Keldisch, Peter Landauer, uh, Wigner, Smith, and all these. So it's all pretty famous physicists. Sure, but that was before we had computers. <laughs> and then a very clever Russian guy, I mean, whose name I apologize, I mean, it's not, hopefully not on tape, uh, I don't recall, um, Sasha would know it, actually then came up with, uh, and explained all these different tunneling theories with the Feynman pass formalism with different averaging over the Feynman pass. And that gave all the different tunneling times. And you know, and why these people um, um, you know, when you look at the Feynman path, you know, some took the real part of it, of the averagings, other ones took the imaginary, and this gives you all these different times. So with the Feynman path, uh, normally, I would think, because, you know, I'm just a, an experimentalist, you know, trying to think, you know, there should, there should be a clear guidance how you average over the Feynman path. And you know, and the one that we actually, uh, that uh, Sasha did, which is the more straightforward one, is basically in agreement with our experiment. So, so I think it is a big deal because it's a very fundamental uh, quantum mechanical process that we resolve for the first time. This is the first single electron um, tunnel um, measurement that has been done ever. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is really great because it's, a, it's, it's an experiment, it's got a clear result. I'm just not really understanding why the theorists can't agree on oh, how to calculate it because it's, it's just quantum mechanics. Can you defend yes, yourself, guys. Magic? Because, you know, we have, and really, I mean, I just got this work finally after a year of dispute with nature and it is rejected, right? And I really hate it. I mean, believe me, it really hurts in my heart. So anyway, we got it finally rejected and you should read the comments of these people. They're very emotional. It must be a theoretician who is not in the field and says, all this stuff is nonsense and quantum mechanics. There is, you can't do time. Uh, this goes against the answer uncertainty principle, right? It's nearly like philosophy, abusing uncertainty principle. You need to understand what is your uncertainty principle? Where, what are your observables, right? Don't stop being emotional, guys. Let's be <laughs> physics. That's what I want, right? I want to do physics and we're entering in auto second science now results and measurements that may be really disturbing you a little bit, right? Because we're going to force you to think in terms that you're not comfortable with. But this is all what matters, right? That's why we're in after second science. And for young people, let me tell you, there's a lot of potential here. You might want to change fields. From <laughs> <laughs> we can use a lot of smart young people in this field. And the theoreticians have no clue. <laughs> okay, That's the big deal. Last question. <laughs> you have the last question, right? No, you don't have that. Okay. Good. 
So probably then I will ask the last question. Mm -hmm. What's the implication to the one photon, two photon, multi photon process, ionization process? Probably. Yeah, that's actually the question. This was also part of my ERC um, um, proposal. So we're just in the beginning of it all, and of course I would like to understand how this all scales, and you know how it uh, how it scales from multi photon to. To, um, uh, to tunnel ionization. Because in principle, when you look, um, Keldish in his paper also defined two regimes, the multi-photon ionization process and the tunnel ionization process. And he actually used the tunneling time, his Keldish time, as a separation between the two. But you know, we don't really see anything happening like a phase transition or anything, uh, because all our, our experiments are around gamma, around one, right? plus minus one around one. So, uh, so I think there is still a lot of things uh, that we would like to understand. And it is a big deal because it's a very fundamental quantum mechanical process and I would like to understand that. Thank you very much, Astella Keller. Okay, so. thank you very much.